Oh, hi, my name is Kevin and I collect old irons. And today we're going to be talking about the small irons, which are actually quite a big category. We'll be spending the next three videos on this general topic. Small irons, it turns out, are collected not just by old iron collectors, but also by toy collectors and doll collectors as well. There are two superb books on this subject, both by Judy and Frank Pulitzer. Judy the writer, Frank the photographer. These are Tuesday's Children and Early Tuesday Morning, published in 1977 and 1986. Tuesday was, of course, the traditional day for ironing, and prominent toys for little girls in those gone days were dolls and little irons. These books are for sale on the PICA webpage, and that link will be included in the descriptions. What the Pulitzers did in their Tuesday Children books was to find the small of small irons at less than four inches. By the way, that is almost exactly the same as 10 centimeters, which is just a little bit shorter. I will use this four inch scale in all the photographs that are taken from my collection in this video. That size range includes not just toys, but some working irons were also of that size because they were used between the buttons or for travel. Judy Pulitzer did some pretty detailed research on the diversity of these irons, coupled with illustrations from period catalogs, mostly from the 1880s to early 1900s. These irons are illustrated not just by photographs, but also by the bottom outline to show size. A neat idea. We hear a lot about the small irons being salesman samples, but I think the salesman samples, the working irons, and sometimes the toy irons also are all the same thing. Let's take a look at this sensible and this over iron. Both of these are just about four inches long. Both of these have the same markings as the full size irons. I think these are working irons used for small fabrics or small spaces, but they could also be used for salesman samples for sure. And if one of these fell into the hands of a child, then they would be used as a toy. So how do you tell a small working irons from those that were made and sold as toys? The working irons are very much the full size in miniature. They include a name and patent markings and so forth. Whereas the toy, and I have here a smaller Ober again, have a much simpler design. For the star irons, size went from quite large to a variety of smaller sizes. All of these have holes in the handle to help dissipate heat. The handle is attached to a top plate that is either bolted or screwed to the bottom piece, and the back of the bottom is upturned to provide a polishing surface. But here is a star iron that is more simply made. The holes do not go all the way through. The top is without patent dates. There is an apparent screw here, but this is part of the casting. It's not a real screw. And the bottom is flat without the polishing end. This would be a toy. Here are two small Mrs. Potts irons. These measure about three and three quarter inches long. No doubt these could be used as toys, but I think more often these were used as small irons working in small areas of fabric. The iron here is very much a copy of the large size iron with a wooden knob and so forth. This one has a intricate device of spring and latch and the bottom is chromed. The one here is very similar but in this case the latch is made of steel and there are some other um, subtle changes to make this a bit simpler. I think this may well have been uh, made as a toy or used as a giveaway and as we've seen in some of the other videos Enterprise was very proactive in using giveaways. There is no uncertainty about this one. This is labeled Potts Toy. This measures three inches and sold at a recent online auction for $100. Here are two toys in the style of Mrs. Potts irons as shown by the curved handles. These measure three and three quarter inches. The one on the left is called the Pearl, and the other is has, I think, an Indian chief's head on the base. Similar irons occur in other markings. 
These are much more lightly built than the Mrs. Potts irons with detachable handles that we saw above. We mentioned in the Foundries video the A.C. Williams Company of Ravenna, Ohio that made licensed versions of the Enterprise Potts and other irons. By the 1870s, these were being replaced by more sophisticated technologies and Williams discovered that there was a big market for cast iron toys. These toys were made in huge numbers and Williams was not the only company that made these. This one, a double pointed design, has the original paint. Gold was a popular color, maybe to simulate the brass that was associated with the better irons of that time. This was cast in one piece. The wood handle is simulated by a darker paint. This iron has a very nice patina. The original colors would have been brighter. By the way, for any neophytes out there, do not repaint your painted irons. The painted colors are part of the history of this piece. Similarly, here are two small flat irons that I consider working irons. This is a Wapak. It is four inches across and this is Chattanooga Manufacturing Company, a little bit shorter. I consider these to be working irons because they are marked and presented in the style of larger size irons. But others of similar size do not have the markings and may have been sold as toys. And there are many smaller cast iron sat irons that were surely toys or may have been used uh, for ornamentational purposes in other ways. Some of these are in glass, ceramic, wood, what have you. The Pulitzer book has documented many differences in handle grip, posts, general size, and so forth. I will not use the word varieties here because these are often from different companies. I think the biological concept of diversity, referring to multiple species rather than the variation within a single species, is a better term. In matters of taxonomy, the scientist in me comes out. Up to this point, everything we've covered is quite common and for the most part has a range in the $10, maybe $20 realm. There are, however, a variety of more modern copies, reproductions if you will, and Pulitzer spends some time talking in her books about how to distinguish these. By and large, the more modern copies have a coarser texture, uh, less smooth bottom, and the metal has a greater color. For example, these flat iron shapes are very common. We found a box of these once and have spent years trying to sell them off in our little B&B &B gift corner. These have simple wire handles and a very grainy and grayish base with a number or a star on top. These are modern made from Mexico. Another group of the toy irons are the swans. Many sizes and subtle distinctions from multiple companies. These also occur in older and newer versions, so let the buyer beware. Although prices of both antique and more modern examples are mostly in the few dollars realm. The most sought after of these swans have the original paint. This one sold at the 2018 Balestri auction for $70. We plan a video on the animal themed irons and probably another on the swans. Both groups are widely collected. What I have shown so far are small versions of the common American flat and detachable handle designs. But small irons that have detailed markings and more complicated handles have higher values. Here, for example, are some small flat irons with unusual markings. Note the fancy marking on the side of this iron and the unusual markings on the top of this iron. These might have values of $50, maybe more if selling to a serious collector of toy irons who does not have that particular type. But there's also a wide range of more unusual small irons. This is a small Magic Sensible, very much the same as this larger equivalent over here. Is this a working iron, a salesman sample, or a toy? I think it's all three. What this is, is very much the same construction as the larger iron here. Streeter knew his audience was already well familiar with his Magic series, so this might have been a very useful salesman sample to show the potential buyer that this iron did not have the internal slug that was by then going out of fashion. And surely the housewife who already liked the Streeters would opt for a toy for the daughter. This iron is worth 
hundred dollars, maybe more. And here is an interesting iron that we have not seen before. This is the P.W. Wheatus, patented 1870 in Philadelphia. And the Wheatus iron, let's remind ourselves, 1870 was before Mrs. Potts had come out with her series of irons at a time when there was no good detachable handled iron design. So we just had an idea of, I'm going to unlatch the top, a handle that has only one point in contact, so the base would be heated on the stove and the handle would hang over the lip of the stove and presumably not be heating as much. How efficient this was, I'm not sure. But there are a couple of different varieties of these, so they are made for some time. They're not too overly uncommon. Values here would be 40 to $60, um, maybe a little more if you have really good markings on the top. These markings tend to uh, diminish by oxidation. But there is a much rarer small equivalent. This picture is from the Dave Irons 4 auction. The iron is four and a quarter inches across the bottom. Again, I'll here count that as small. And I think this is very likely a salesman sample. I doubt that this saw much use as a working iron or as a toy. And this is rare. Sold for $1,100. And here is a toy Geneva fluter. Three and a half inches across the bottom. Just a wire handle. I think this was made exclusively as a toy. This one sold for $130 at a Dave Irons auction. Here is a smaller toy Geneva, one and three quarter inches, so half the size of the previous. No markings on the bottom. This sold for $160. This is a toy goose. A reminder, tailor irons in those days were known as goose irons, plural gooses. And toy gooses are notably rare. And that may be because little boys were not necessarily aspiring to or encouraged to be tailors when they grew up. Little girls, on the other hand, were encouraged to be housewives, and so their options in terms of toys were more limited. This measures four and three eighths inches, so I'm again stretching the definition of small, but this is a notably small size for goose iron. This is pretty well made, so perhaps it may have been used as a hat iron, or I'd like to think it was used by a very junior tailor. I should tell you there is another group of small goose irons, but these are not toys or working irons for that matter. These were made as advertisements selling goods that a tailor would be buying, such as fabric. And we will be talking about these, for the most part, small advertising irons in the next video. There is an interesting small iron that crosses over into the community of glass collectors who often specialize in some specific company. And there may be no American glass company whose products are more highly sought after and can reach greater prices than the Sandwich Glass Company of Sandwich and also Boston, Massachusetts. This company operated from 1825 to 1888 and included glass artisans who were allowed to show their individual skills well. One of the products of this company was a small glass iron. These were pressed into a mold. All the ones that I have seen are the same size and shape, but they come in many colors. These used to be worth several hundred dollars, but I was very happy to acquire one at a recent auction for $20. These prices have really come down in recent years, perhaps because there are a few sandwich and fewer iron collectors. There is a lot more that can be said here, but it is not the goal of these videos to be definitive. We have here not talked about the toy sat iron stands or said anything about the toy electric irons. But we do need to say something about the world's most famous small iron. The Monopoly piece. Note the small flat iron in the foreground. The flat iron was my personal favorite Monopoly token as a child, well before I was collecting irons. I sometimes wonder if there might be some connection here. This was one of the six original Monopoly tokens, first used in 1936. The others being the Thimble, Cannon, Top Hat, 
Shoe, and Battleship. The Flatiron was retired in 2013. It was essentially voted off the board in an online election on Facebook and was replaced by a cat. Of the original Monopoly tokens, the Top Hat, Shoe, and Battleship are still used on the board. We will say more about the history of the Monopoly piece in the next video when we talk about small advertising irons made by the same company and other advertising irons too. And then we have a video about the European small and toy irons and we have another auction coming up. So we have things to look forward to and I look forward to seeing you again.